Welcome to the cutting edge of the global awakening. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. Well, it looks like the North Tower of the World Trade Center has just completely collapsed. The U.S. dollar's status as the preeminent reserve currency is under attack. This is a mathematical fact. Tens of trillions of dollars are being extracted from the United States of America. You really want the truth? Then just follow the money. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio, a broadcast dedicated to your personal, spiritual, and financial liberty. And now, here's your voice of reason in the midst of global chaos, economist and best-selling author, Jerry Robinson. Ah, friends, welcome to this week's edition of Follow the Money Weekly. So glad that you're joining us all around the world. You can find us online as always at ftmdaily.com. That is FTM, like follow the money, daily.com. You can also find us on social media. We're on facebook.com forward slash FTM daily, twitter.com forward slash FTM daily, and youtube.com forward slash FTM daily. Sure do enjoy hearing from some of you through Twitter. You know, it's such a, such a great way to have a conversation. Anytime you hear anything on the program, you have a question about, or maybe you want to talk to me directly. You can often do that through Twitter. I can't always get back, you know, immediately, but uh, it sure is a good way to converse. So if you have a comment about the show, or if you just want to share something that you heard in the show with others, uh, please consider doing that through social media. It's so powerful. Well, what a week for precious metals. It's been a very tough last couple of days. Well, you know, of course, even going back for the last uh, several years, it's been very, very tough for these markets, for those of you holding gold and silver and even commodities. Now, you may remember it was just not too long ago that we closed down our PACE investment portfolio. It's been several months ago. And we saw the writing on the wall. We saw that this was probably not going to be getting much better anytime soon. We cashed out of our mining stocks and some of the other things that we had, although we had really lightened up on mining. We were pretty heavy in other areas. And so now as we see gold tumbling to a new five-year low and oil prices dipping below $50 a barrel for the first time since April just recently. And as the dollar continues to rise, reaching its highest level in three months against a basket of other major currencies on Tuesday, it's hard to say just when those current trends will shift. What's happening, however, is important for investors to pay close attention to. When the U.S. dollar rises, you know by now that it places downward pressure on the prices of commodities and other hard assets that are priced in dollars. Our popular global currency monitor identified a new long-term buy signal in the U.S. dollar back in July of 2014, and the uptrend continues to this day. In fact, there are only two currencies that we track that are in buy mode currently. Our subscribers can view those and get monthly updates by going to ftmdaily.com forward slash currency ratings. But why is the U.S. dollar rising? Well, there's a few factors. But chief among them is the anticipation of a coming hike in U.S. interest rates from their near zero levels in the coming months. Despite much of the recent global market turmoil, the Federal Reserve continues to indicate its plan to raise interest rate targets later this year. Many observers believe that this rate hike will occur in September, but I disagree. I don't expect an interest rate hike at all in 2015. And while I could be wrong, I'm not alone. Peter Schiff, who is a friend of the show and a popular financial commentator, agrees, and he will join me on next week's program to explain his reasoning. My own reasoning for not believing the Fed will hike rates this year is fairly straightforward. It has to do with the broad sell-off that we've experienced in commodities and in the strengthening dollar, which both serve to indicate disinflationary pressures on the horizon. Now, disinflation is not inflation and it's not deflation. Instead, disinflation is a slowing of the rate of inflation. And the Fed has long stated that one of the key data points that it is watching is the inflation rate. The growing state of disinflation, I think, weakens the argument for a near-term rise in U.S. interest rates. 
But as you may have surmised from today's show title, today's broadcast is about gold. In a moment, Precious Metals advisor Tom Cloud will be here with his latest insights on the gold, silver, and platinum markets. And then after that, I'll be joined by my good friend and fellow investor Jay Taylor, who has been tracking the gold mining sector since the early 1980s. He'll provide his own insights on the current state of the U.S. markets, and he will even give us a few names of his favorite gold mining stocks that he is stalking as we await the next uptrend in gold. Investors who are seeking near-term capital preservation or appreciation should not consider any of the precious metals at this juncture. The metals, which are all locked in a long-term downtrend, should strictly be viewed as insurance from the next economic collapse until the current downtrend ends. Gold is an asset that the government cannot print at will, and that's why I own it. But it's not a get-rich-quick investment. It is for those who are concerned about the current trajectory of America's debt-based paper economy and are seeking shelter from the inevitable storm that will arise when confidence in this system fails, which history tells us is all but certain to occur. Timing that event is impossible, but knowing that it will occur is half of the battle. The other half is taking action to protect yourself, your family, and your finances. I outline step by step how you can do this in my book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation. You can learn more online at ftmdaily.com forward slash bankruptcy. Are you prepared for the next stock market crash? It's not too late to protect yourself and your family with Jerry Robinson's best selling book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, now in a new audiobook format. Whether you want to listen in the car, at the gym, or on your iPad, we've got you covered. Get the entire 300-page book in audio format for only $24.95. That's over 12 hours of Jerry Robinson's economic wisdom, financial insights, and practical money-making strategies for only $24.95. Inside this new audiobook, you'll learn 21 profitable income streams you can create both now and in retirement, along with unique tips on how to inflation-proof your investment portfolio using our own PACE philosophy and our five levels of financial freedom, which is Jerry Robinson's personal blueprint for building true wealth. If your goal is to become a better investor, increase your income, or just understand what is really happening in the global economy, you cannot afford to miss out on the vital information that is jam-packed into this 12-hour audio book. Get instant access to Bankruptcy of Our Nation in audio format right now by going online to www.ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. That's ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. Download your copy today and get on the fast track to true wealth and a lifetime of financial security. Follow the Money Weekly presents your precious metals market update. Here's Tom Cloud. As I record this on Tuesday, gold is around 1112 it's down now 6% for the year, and silver is right at $15, and it's down about 10% for the year so far. And people are calling, wanting to know whether or not to buy or to sell, and certainly that's always a personal decision when you see these drops. But one thing we've talked about in the past, and I've sent out in writing to you, is that the months of August, September, and October have not had one year in the 14 years of this bull market where gold and silver did not exceed 7.5% during that three-month period. So certainly I do think that's going to do even better than 7.5%. So I really do look at it as a buying opportunity, but we do know that, as I said, both metals are down for the year. But certainly the words like uh, plunged and plummeted, are certainly not applicable. I mean, they've moved about like the stock market. The stock market has separated itself the last two weeks where it's slightly up now while the silver and gold are down. But also, a lot of calls are coming in about platinum, and we have sold more platinum uh, in the last three or four days since it went below a 1,000 than we have uh, probably in the last couple of years. So when you have a metal that's 46 times more rare than gold, and you can buy it at $120 an ounce cheaper than gold, it's a metal that has been at $2,000 per ounce. It's now, like I said, below, uh, 980 uh, below 1,000. So certainly it would not hurt to add platinum to your portfolio. This is a gift at these kind of prices. It is an industrial metal. It's not a 
monetary metal like gold is, and, and silver being an industrial metal first, and a monetary or investment metal second. Uh, we'll be watching this week the manufacturing index in China. Everybody's watching it very closely, hoping it will come in over 50, and it will take us out of a recession talk in China, and hopefully steady the stock market over there that's dropped so much. So uh, watch as the week wears on. You could see gold and silver start jumping as early as Thursday morning on future contracts that are closing. Uh, the Shemitah is right around the corner. We're only six weeks away roughly to the Shemitah time frame that starts uh, where uh, we, you've read the mystery of the Shemitah and the repetitiveness of the stock market dropping over 25% every seven years starting in 1973 with no exceptions. And certainly that doesn't mean it will this year, but certainly it's something you've got to be aware of in your portfolio. So there's really a lot of, it's a slow time normally in July. It's always considered the slowest month. And here we are right now with two to four week delays delivering silver and two week delays delivering gold. Some gold uh, we have live uh, right away, but a lot of it is delayed. I can't imagine what it's going to be like the next three months. But just remember, when you order from us and you pay us, we keep your money in escrow until they ship your article to you, we then pay. So we never put your money at risk. But this is time to be doing your homework and allocation work. And for any of you that are interested in having gold and silver physical in your IRAs, you need to give us a call. And if you have any questions about the silver and gold market, we're happy to answer those. You can reach us at 800-247-2812. That's 800-247-2812. And also, um, we continue to believe the rare coins are going to continue to be worse investment. If you have those, we're happy to discuss those with you also. If you're not getting our email blast, uh, it's no cost and it's completely confidential. You can sign up at ftmdaily.com and go to the Precious Metals button. If you don't like it, you can always unsubscribe. Uh, but it does, we do keep information flowing to you about prices and market conditions and where we see markets going. So hopefully all that will be helpful. But we're getting ready to get more active. We may have another week of things being kind of slow. But once again, when it starts moving this time, we are looking for double-digit moves in both gold and silver over the next three months, starting uh, August the 1st, if not this Thursday or Friday. With this week's Precious Metals Market Update, this is Tom Cloud signing out. Hey friends, this is Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly. Recently, we have been receiving many emails from our listeners commenting on the great help they're getting from our precious metals expert, Tom Cloud. Gold and silver are excellent hedges against the growing threat of coming U.S. inflation. Who's your gold guy? Make it Tom Cloud. With over 30 years' experience with precious metals, Tom will answer all of your questions. Don't buy your gold and silver through some call center and pay inflated prices. Call my good friend Tom Cloud and speak directly with him and get all of your questions answered. For a limited time, Tom is offering free shipping and insurance on every gold and silver purchase made by our listeners. Call 800 247 2812. And when you do, tell him that Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly sent you. And he'll throw in that free shipping and insurance on your entire order. Call your gold guy, Tom Cloud, right now for the very best deals on gold and silver coins. 800-247-2812. That is 800-247-2812. Welcome back to Follow the Money Weekly. And here's Jerry Robinson. All right, well, joining me on the line today is Jay Taylor. He's the editor of Jay Taylor's Gold, Energy, and Tech Stocks newsletter, and he's the host of the web-based radio program, Turning Hard Times into Good Times. Jay, it's great to uh, 
talk to you again. Well, it, it, likewise, it's good to, uh, to talk with you again as well. I remember I had you on my radio show once, and we need to do it more often. Yeah, really appreciated you coming on to your program. Of course, you and I met at a financial conference of some sort we were both uh, we were both speaking at. And uh, since then, uh, I've been able to follow some of your work on your website. You know, you do a great job focusing upon fundamentals, whereas we focus a lot on technical. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to the discussion. And what a time to be talking about, you know, your main niche, which is really gold mining. And I want to get to gold mining. That's what you've been focused on in your newsletter. Uh, so you've been publishing that since about 1981. Is that right? That's right. right. I, I guess I'm kind of dating myself. But uh, so... All right, so what a week uh, to talk about gold. I mean, here we are looking at gold hitting five-year lows this week, a lot of it coming on a strong dollar, a lot of it coming on uh, weakness out of China. Why don't you give our folks a sense of what you're thinking right now as you see gold at a five-year low? What's happening? Well, I think, Jerry, the, the main thing that needs to be realized is that the establishment hates gold. Gold is kind of like, you know, when when someone is breaking into a, breaking in and entering into a house at night, and they hate to see the floodlight come on. Gold is a is a thermometer that lets people know what the temperature is of the economy, and if things are not good, gold tends to go up. So, in order to keep people confident in the system, in the monetary system, <laughs> conned, if you will, right. uh, the the establishment has to convince people that that gold that the dollar really is better than gold. It's not as good as gold. You know, we used to say the dollar is as good as gold because you could actually take your dollars and, before Roosevelt at least, could take your dollars and get gold in exchange for it. Internationally, we could do that until 1971. But now, of course, since Nixon took us off the gold standard in 71, we started this credit binge globally. And this credit binge has gotten us into deep trouble. Uh, the whole global economy, including the United States, I'm afraid, is very rapidly moving towards insolvency. And if the world sort of understood that if 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 gold started going up very rapidly then people would start to call into question the um uh, you know, they would start dumping dollars and buying gold. Essentially, is what they do. They would trash the petrodollar for the real for the real dollar. The dollar was defined by our constitution, required gold and silver. Since then, we've scrapped that because it would be easier, and we didn't want to succumb to the. We didn't want to. Americans didn't want to have to be disciplined by the gold standard. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too, have an easy life, and so that's what we embarked on. And it's gotten us into a huge amount of trouble. The problem is that if they if the establishment really allowed the gold price to be a true and honest market uh, the dollar would be down in my view and gold would be much much higher so what is being done Jerry and I have no doubt about this in my mind now having researched it and I've had actually on my own website at jtaylormedia.com I've had extensive interviews with an engineer named David Jensen who has uh, done a lot of digging it's not just David there's a lot of people that have have done a lot of research uh, the gold price that's quoted and that you chart and that I'm looking at charts in front of us, it comes out, uh, is really not a true bullion price. It is a paper gold price. It's, uh, there is something like uh, 100 times more uh, paper volume than actual gold volume on these markets. Uh, Let and, me stop you. Yeah. Let me stop you there, Jay, mm-hmm. because some of the folks in our audience are new to the concept of uh, precious metals. Not all of our folks, the majority of our folks get it, but some of them are new. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you say paper market and physical market, why don't you break that apart for a moment for the beginner and explain what you're talking about? Okay, so you can go out into the, uh, into the markets and, and buy futures contracts, you know, and you're putting a certain amount of money down that gives you the right to buy, a con- uh, to buy say, gold in the future, or, uh, 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 or you can sell it uh, in the future if you're a miner or you're or you just want to speculate, and you're not intending to either. You're not intending to either buy or sell the uh, the metal. All you really want to do is gamble on the direction of the price. And so what we have essentially is large money center banks that are going in with absolutely huge amounts of paper gambles on either side of this market, and the massive amount of trading is so great that a handful, three, four banks can basically make this market and move it back and forth in the direction they want and create a, uh, a virtual price for gold that has nothing to do or very, very little to do with the actual price or the actual demand for gold and silver because it's so much greater. Uh, it, it, a case in point, and the silver markets are even more extensive, but the, the silver markets is something like um, you know, more more 
uh, paper is traded in one day than in an entire year of, of actual silver being traded uh, on the LBMA in London. And, the physical. Yeah, the, phys- the, 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 the physical. So you have paper contracts that represent the physical, but most of the people that are involved in these trades have no desire to, to, take the, to sell the physical or buy the physical. They're simply gambling. They're gambling on, on which direction they think the market's going to go. And there's a, a three or four major players, big money center banks that everybody knows, household names, that are in there with massive amounts of paper. You saw this morning, uh, uh, this morning being uh, Monday morning, the gold price took, I don't know, went down 50 bucks in a matter of minutes. That, were, that, that was not a, a lot of small uh, corporate traders and various people, individuals trading gold. That was a handful of major banks that slammed the market down. Now, why would they do that? Well, you, on one level, I'm sure they're just traders, people that are going back and forth and trying to make, a mo- make money, and they're, uh, and they're sophisticated uh, logarithms that allow them to know when to get in and when to pick someone else's pocket, basically. But it has very little, if anything, to do with the real price of gold. Now... That would change if the masses started to say, oh, goodness, I don't think I believe that the Fed has things under control anymore. I don't really believe that uh, in the Ph.D. standard, I think maybe gold might be good to have some of that. And maybe, Jerry, maybe your listeners, a lot of them believe that, understand that. But I can tell you, living in New York, that if I walked down the street down on Fifth Avenue and started asking people, I think they would, you know, they would look at me like I have three heads if I said, do you think you should own some gold? People in New York... Have total belief in uh, in the PhD standard, uh, you know, in, in these brilliant people with PhDs behind their names from Princeton, Harvard, and Yale. They don't think there's anything that, that, that barbaric that it is a barbaric relic. That gold is, as Lord Kane said, is a barbaric relic, and they believe that, and they've been taught that in the universities, and so they don't they don't understand. But uh, and so what they have to do though is create they have to create a market that suggests to people it's not wise to buy gold. You know, I, I'm a fundamental fundamental analyst, so I'm looking at mining companies on a regular basis, trying to figure out whether they've got the goods and whether they can uh, get the gold out of the ground economically. But of course, if the price continues to fall very dramatically, then it makes it more difficult. Uh, on one hand, on the other hand, though, I should also mention that during credit contractions. The great credit contractions of the 1930s, and briefly we saw it in 2008, uh, 2009, 10, 11, uh, when there was actual a credit contraction and a decline in, a sharp decline in the price of various commodities, that is actually the best time for gold and gold mining because the price of gold goes down less than the, than the items that are required to get it out of the ground. And sometimes that also includes labor. So labor can go down. Uh, I know in the mining industry, for example, lots of people, uh, there's uh, people that do the drilling, the people that do the exploration work and so forth, are really hurting for jobs now. So they're willing to work for a lot less. So that's, that's working in favor of the gold mining companies. Energy prices are down uh, dramatically from where they were. So the gold mining companies in some ways are getting a break in that, in, in that direction too, especially if they're low grades, uh, and it takes you have to move a lot of rock to get an ounce of gold out. Those are energy dependent projects, and so so I wouldn't say so that it's it's not so clear cut. I mean, gold could actually go down nominally and go up in terms of its purchasing power. In in 2008 2009, the real price of gold went up very dramatically, and I measure that relative to the Rogers Raw Materials Fund. You know, in 2008. Uh, I believe it was like in August yet, you, uh, an ounce of gold would buy only 17% of the Rogers Raw Materials Fund, which you may be familiar with, a, a basket of commodities of, of food and um, energy and metals. Uh, by 2010, or 2009, it had gone up to 43%. So an ounce of gold would have bought 43% of that basket of commodities in, in that short period of time. It's still much higher than it was back then. So my point is that, you know, I like to look at the economics, but that said, Jerry, I wish that I had lightened up in terms of my uh, portfolio um, allocation to gold mining shares back along February 2013 when you were telling your uh, your listeners to to buy uh, to buy the dollar or to sell your gold for the dollar, I guess. 
Yeah, gold mining stocks still a major uh, sell signal in our system, and of course we're waiting for that moment mm-hmm. where the mo- momentum finally picks up. Let's talk about what would spark that, because of course on our side here on FTM Daily, you know we are simply watching the momentum, we are watching the technical indicators, and we have our own proprietary technical uh, system that we use, but. When it comes to the actual fundamental reason, the spark mm-hmm. that creates that uptrend, let's talk about some of the things that could cause that. Because, you know, thinking, we go back, Jay, mm-hmm. we, we go back to the time of uh, 2007, 2008, we had this amazing run-up from beginning in about 2000 with the price of gold and silver. Mm-hmm. And then by the time we got to 2007, 2008, the market really craters and this desire for hard assets and this desire for gold and silver in particular really began to emerge. And by the time we got to 2011, you know, 2012, as it was peaking, it seemed as if a lot of the hard asset types and people like you and I began to fall by the wayside as the price began to fall. Mm -hmm. And it seemed as if the Fed had achieved that escape velocity. They had been able to create the wealth effect Mm -hmm. through all of their printing of money. And Mm -hmm. somehow people had believed that maybe we're out of the woods. Now, now you and I both know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So so what is the catalyst in your mind? Give us a couple of scenarios that could cause uh, gold and silver to re-engage and begin moving higher and for the dollar to begin falling. What are some of the things you're watching for? Well, again, I think it's the confidence game uh, and it's the, you know, the, the belief in the Ph.D. standard. Uh, I think that, um, you know, and the ability of the Fed to, to navigate the economy and to, the Fed to actually create wealth, which is a fallacy, but that's what, that's what everybody's taught in the universities and that's what they believe uh, and they have to keep people believing that. First of all, I believe, and I think you probably agree with me, that the economy, uh, to any great extent, is not benefiting from the massive amounts of debt that have been put on the Fed balance sheets. That, in fact, uh, the, the, the U.S. economy and, indeed, the global economy is really suffering yet. Uh, that's my belief. Uh, at some point in time, um, you know, the rubber is going to hit the road and people are going to realize that things are not as good as they seem to be now. They've been very, very good for people on Wall Street. They've been very, very good for the one percenters, the people that have enough money to buy, uh, to buy things in the stock market. In some markets, like where I'm at here in New York City, housing prices are again now reaching their peaks. Uh, Brooklyn and Queens, where I live, uh, very robust markets. And wherever the money center uh, areas are, they seem to have done very well. San Francisco, uh, you know, the West Coast, the East Coast, close to the money where the big money banks banks are because that's where the money is created out of nothing and people have you know are, are doing quite well but i would say at the expense of of everybody else you know i think it's very interesting to note that uh with quantitative easing their gold was very well correlated to qe and the increase in the monetary base up until 2011 at the very time in which the u.s dollar was downgraded I don't remember if it was Moody's or which which service downgraded the U.S. debt. It was right. at that very time, I think, that the policymakers said, we've got to do something about this thermometer called gold. We have to go in there and smash that gold price. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, gold had 10 years of, of, of gains, 10 successive years of gains. So who's to say that it wasn't just time for a correction? Uh, maybe that's all it was. But I think it's very curious to see that the correlation between quantitative easing and stocks have continued to rise very dramatically. And I'm talking about global quantitative easing now because when the U.S. sort of left its foot off the gas pedal, Japan jumped in and really hit the markets with massive amounts of QE. And now Europe is is doing some of that too. So I would argue that globally, the quantitative easing and the amount of money that's being pumped into the global system has continued to rise. So have stocks. Uh, but gold, curiously enough, at the very time that the treasuries were downgraded, uh, by Moody's, I believe it was. That's when the uh, when that became that detachment occurred between gold and the quantitative easing. What could cause things to change? Well, I don't know what your views are on the equity market. What your technicals are saying? Certainly, a lot of the people that I read are very skeptical about the continuation of this bull market in stocks. But I would think that if we had some sort of a massive correction in stocks, people uh, in the in the equity market, people might start looking at at gold again. I mean, I'm hearing on CNBC and the people that I watch sometimes. Uh, the fast money guys, they're all, all looking for ways 
to make money. They don't care where it is. They're not ideological about it. They don't believe in gold as I do. They just want to make money. So when they, they know that the gold mining shares are, are suppressed, are, are depressed, extremely depressed. And I think at some point in time, they're looking for an opportunity. They'll go there to make money. And if the price of gold somehow breaks free, they'll go there to make money. What would cause it to break free, I, I think it just boils down to confidence. If people lose confidence in the system, and if the system starts to go belly up again, as it did in 2008, 2009, where's the Fed going to, what's the Fed going to do now with zero interest rates already? They can't, they can't even begin to hike rates or the market throws a hissy fit. So I think that, um, I think we could be very close to a turn in these markets. And, and certainly some of the technical analysts that I'm looking at uh, are arguing that we're very near a bottom in gold and in gold shares. Uh, but I think most of them, like you, are suggesting it's not time to uh, to go in or to go in anything more than just a big toe in the water, perhaps, at this time. Sure. You brought up the banks. They're too big to fail. You know, last week on this same program, we agreed with some of the voices that are uh, out there that any bank that is too big to fail and is too big to jail mm -hmm. is simply too big to exist. I mean, you have these big banks now that are 30 to 40 percent larger than they were at the time of the collapse in 2008. Right. And so, you know, we're faced with a similar problem. And you're right. The Fed is really out of ammunition. They can't lower rates any more than they have. All they could do is just print more money, which would, of course, put downward pressure on rates. Yeah. And so it's, it's really something to watch. Now, I want to go back to something you said earlier on in the conversation because I, th I found it interesting, and I, I do agree with you that the majority of people out there – frown on gold. They do. They, mm -hmm. they they don't understand it. Their entire lives have been spent in a paper economy. They don't understand the idea or the need for any kind of measurement for the actual currency. There's nothing underlying the currency. So you mentioned a gold standard, and I was thinking about this the other day. Thinking back through time, we think about some different manias and different bubbles that we've seen. Just throwing one out, we can think of tulip mania, mm -hmm. which you know, which struck what was it, uh, Amsterdam or something? Right. It was somewhere, yeah, somewhere in Europe, sixteen hundred, and yeah. In the 1600s, and everybody was buying tulip flowers, you know, and, the, and it just became this huge bubble, and then it finally burst. Well, I don't think anyone could really disagree with the fact that the United States is a bigger bubble than what tulip mania was. Mm. I mean, the, the, this really is, you know, a, an enormous bubble. The difference is is that because it undergirds our entire economic infrastructure, this dollar and the debt markets, we're willing to move heaven and earth to protect it. Whereas with tulip mania, eh, you can let it fall. Right. You know, They weren't willing to move heaven and earth. So I'm always reminded of that uh, Keynes quote, while I disagree with Keynes on most, most things, he sure did nail it when he said, uh, the markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain soft. <laughs> it, you know, very true. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering... If we're going to see this meltdown in our lifetime, or that they can continue this uh, this con game, mm -hmm. but of course, more specifically, I want to ask you about that gold standard in particular. Do you think that's the solution? And if so, that would really be a major shift. It seems like the only way we could ever get back to a gold standard mm -hmm. it would require a complete collapse. People would be pliable and flexible for change. Yeah. Do you see the gold standard as the solution? Well, you know, I think it goes deeper than that. I think that I think the gold standard for people who put some credence in the Bible, as I do, uh, in the Old Testament, it talks about honest weights and measures. Mm -hmm. uh, gold is an honest, a gold monetary system encourages, and in fact, if it's held in its purity, is an honest system of weights and measures. I think what we really need to do is go back to a change of hearts. I think people have to want to do what's right. I think they have to have to understand. First of all, we've been we've been taught in this country uh, through our statist educational system uh, that there is no God, essentially. Yeah, you know, no, there's lots of people that are still God fearing in this country. But if you've gotten rid of God, then what's right and what's wrong? Uh, and then you can start to make all kinds of exceptions. And I think that's what the fiat monetary system is all about. The, co the common folks would do best under a gold system because it, it gives us everybody equal weights and measures. It's an even playing field for everybody. So I don't think it's going to happen. And if we had a collapse of the system, will it happen? No, I, you know, I'm not terribly hopeful about that. I would like to think that that's, I think that would have to happen before before there's even a chance of it, honestly. And then maybe people start to re-examine their spiritual lives and their hearts and their minds, and maybe we could get back to something like that. 
But frankly, I, I, I think what's more likely to happen is more totalitarian rule. I think that's what I fear most about, is if we have a collapse of the system, and I think it's, it's going to come, when it's going to come, I think only God Almighty knows, but at some point in time it will. Then I think, you know, each of us have to examine our own, our own lives and our own hearts and minds and know how we're going to deal with it. And if you happen to have faith in God and believe there's something beyond the four dimensions of time and space, as I do, then there's some hope. And then we can start loving and caring for each other and maybe not grab grab materialism from everybody else and don't without a concern about what we're doing to other people because I think that's where we're at. I think the whole notion that, that and this is a falsehood about capitalism too by the way, the Ayn Rand version of capitalism that says that greed is good and we should just well, I, I understand how markets work and I and I really don't disagree with that entirely. But the point is that we have to care for our fellow man. And I think at the very heart of this Keynesian barbaric relic notion of gold is a sense that 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 the PhD standard is better than the gold standard because they're the PhD standard is the God standard for these people. So I don't know. Um, I I'm hopeful. I you know I guess what I'm trying to say is I think there needs to be a spiritual revival of sorts, Jerry. You know, and I know that's way off base for a lot of my uh, a lot of my friends here in New York, but I just I really believe that that's true. Well, I would say that the, a large portion of our audience would agree. And what you hit on there, whenever you talk about the unjust weights and balances, mm -hmm. is something that is so lost, I would say, on the majority of financial analysts oh, and sure. economists. They have no clue what you're talking no, about. No, they don't. You know, but, but it's something that we have hammered here over and over again, Jay, because... That really is the root of our problems. I mean, we don't have an honest monetary system. Yeah, and I think, you know, if we had a gold standard, you know, people, first of all, uh, the sinful nature of man has always been here since the Garden of Eden. So that's not, it's not like gold, Put a, give us a gold standard and people become good. But it is a, a discipline system that holds in checks the excesses that have taken place. The whole notion that you can somehow print money and create wealth is a fallacy. But, you know, I got interested in gold because back in 1967, and I'm dating myself as a sophomore in college at that time, I had a Dr. Peyton Yoder, who was convinced there was a correlation between the uh, debasement of a currency and the work ethic of nations and, indeed, the morality of nations. And I have become huh. so absolutely convinced that Dr. Yoder was right about that. Because when you start telling people they can have something without working for it, human nature, our sinful human nature, will say, well, yeah, I'll take you up on that. Yeah, give me that freebie. I'll take that. And, mm -hmm. and not thinking about someone had to create that item, that object. Someone had to put their capital and their sweat and their tears into that to make that. But, you know, so I think once we start, I'm old enough to remember, and I remember the men at our church talking about credit cards when they first started coming out. And they would you know, get a credit card to buy gasoline. That was the first thing. And some of the more conservative members at our church would say, eh, it's not a good idea. And some would say, well, I think it's okay if you... Take your credit card, you buy gas, and you pay at the end of the month, and you don't run up a bill. What's wrong with that? But, you know, that's when, in 1971, and that's right be about that time that I'm talking about, we went off the gold standard, and that made it possible for the banks to create infinite amounts of money that has now meant infinite amounts of debt, which is now bankrupting the entire global economy, certainly the Western world. And what it also did was convince people that they could have their cake, they could have their cake and eat it too. They didn't have to worry about it. They could take out student loans. They could do whatever. You can live today and not have to pay for it. And you just keep digging yourself deeper into debt like Greece is doing now. And, but, but people are doing that in our country or have done it. I think a, a slight check on that in 2008, 2009. But I'm convinced that it's, it's really a moral issue. Money is really a moral issue, and we have an ir I think we have an immoral monetary system that is indeed reallocating wealth from the people that create it. You know, the good mid Midwestern farmers, the the industrial, the people that work in factories and make things. I like to say the miners, the manufacturers, the farmers, the inventors, people that actually create things that are useful to people. They're not getting their fair shake because it's being no. siphoned off to the banks and the government. The gov every time I go to Washington, I'm amazed at the expansion of Washington. These huge buildings and the military industrial complex and, and all the other departments of our, uh, of, our, of our government that are so just growing out of control. And I tell you, that's one of the ironies of some of the ultra-capitalists out there who constantly warn about the redistribution of wealth. And at the same time, yeah. you know, they are, they are redistributing wealth from the poor to the rich. Yeah, you know, it's, and, and it, themselves, it's, uh, the, 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 many of the right. people that are most vocal are the, are the richest. Right. Yeah. Right. And they, they constantly warn about it. You said something in one, of your, uh, in one of your newsletters where you said that the price of gold 
threshold is being suppressed, and I use that word not depressed, but suppressed, yeah. to support the U.S. dollar and to underwrite American foreign policy. Yeah. Explain that statement. Well, I think you know one of the main reasons uh, that Nixon had to take us off the gold standard in 1971 was because the U.S. government, I don't know the people necessarily, uh, wanted war in Vietnam. Uh, but but the government, somebody wanted war in Vietnam. We had to have, we were told we had to have war in Vietnam for our own security back here on the other side of the globe. But we had to have a war, and people wanted to have great Johnson's Great Society program, which meant socialism, another another um, ramping up of socialism after after FDR. And so in order to pay for that without being honest with the people and telling the people it was going to cost them something, Nixon started going into debt. So... We went off the gold standard in 1971 because we wanted to be able to, the United States wanted to be able to go into debt, create money out of nothing to pay for our military industrial complex and to also pay for our socialism. So we now spend more money on our military than all the other countries combined, I believe. Uh, it's, a, it's a staggering amount of money uh, that we spend. It's not a staggering amount in GDP, so the people that want to spend more money for GDP will say, well, this, you know, it's not as big as it was during World War II or other times. But it is, it is compared to everybody else, we're spending huge amounts of money, and I think there's an awful lot of off-balance sheet expenditures that go towards the military-industrial complex as well. But the point is that I think right now, I honestly believe what... what, what uh, the way the dollar's been able to survive as long as it has was because uh, Kissinger, uh, it, right after Nixon took us off the gold standard, helped to shape the petrodollar standard. So I think a lot, of, my own belief is that most of the wars that we're fighting in the Middle East these days have very little to do with anything about ISIS or morality or, or protecting Israel or anything like that. My view is it has to do with reshaping the global energy markets so that the U.S., and the uh, Anglo-American empire, I think it's bigger than the U.S. because I don't think the U.S. is really uh, a sovereign nation as we once were, that it's the big corporate uh, elitist interest in shaping what I think is a one-world government goal of theirs. And what I believe they're trying to do is make sure that they keep Putin out of Europe. I think maybe the Iranian agreement here is in part some chess games that are being played to try to keep him out, keep him from selling his petroleum uh, to to Europe. And it's all about controlling the, uh, I think it's all about controlling the petrol markets. Now, Jerry, you, you're more knowledgeable than I am on these, uh, on, on oil. I know that you spent a lot of time and you've written about that. So I don't know, what, I'd be interested in knowing what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think you've hit it dead on. It is about controlling the flow of oil. That petrodollar system is uh, no doubt what motivates foreign policy uh -huh. in my in my mind. And I, yeah, I, I I'm sitting here uh, nodding my head, Jay, as you're talking, because we are on such the same wavelength on so many different mm -hmm. topics. And I know that the audience is listening to this and is probably uh, noticing that as well. I find it very interesting. Let's shift gears for a moment because uh, we we are running out of time. Mm -hmm. Your specialty is obviously gold obviously gold mining in particular mm -hmm. and all these commodities whether they be gold silver oil uranium you know whatever the case might be mm -hmm. they all move through these boom and bust cycles mm -hmm. and where you have the same situation the same opportunity for profit you have a huge run up in the price and then suddenly the price begins to decline because of oversupply and then over time people begin to go out of business the amount of mining goes down this of course creates supply constraints, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you have this demand outpacing supply and the whole thing starts over. Mm -hmm. So you've been following this, of course, in gold and silver mining for years. Yes. Give us your current take on the gold mining industry, and you don't necessarily have to name names of some of the companies that you like. I know you go into detail in your newsletter, mm -hmm. but if you can give us a few uh, of the ones that you're watching and what you look for in a gold mining stock before you buy it. Well, I'm I'm looking at fundamentals primarily, Jerry, and I'm looking at uh, I do I look at exploration companies as well. So I'm looking at companies that I think uh, you know, they're riskier and they're higher. Uh, you know, they're uh, probably the upside is greater if you hit uh, and and if you're able to find something. So one of the things I, I've uh, studied quite a bit of geology. I've been looking at exploration companies to a great extent. So, uh, but in this market, I'm sticking mostly to producers, guys that can keep the cash flow coming and that have good margins uh, at uh, at current gold prices. 
Uh, and, and I should just mention that, you know, it's not just the gold price, but it's the cost of getting it out of the ground, obviously, that's most important for a miner. You want to own gold as a store of value, but when it comes to investing in mining companies, it's not the gold in the ground, it's the cost of getting it out, and that can change over times. So we've had a very dramatic dr- r- fall in the price of oil, uh, you know, in the last year, and that is very helpful to a lot of mining companies, especially those that have large projects that have to move low-grade deposits that have to move an enormous enormous amount of rock to get it, the ounces of gold out. Those are very energy dependent, and so when energy prices go up, those are the biggest disadvantaged companies. Uh, and, and then I look at other companies that, uh, well, there's the higher grade uh, mining projects make more sense when energy prices go up as, as far as that goes. There are companies out there that are managing to make money in this market and doing quite well. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the time is coming when there's going to be uh, there's going to be a huge amount of money made, but timing is difficult. So maybe I have to rely more on you, Jerry, for, for, for some help on that in that regard. For the buy signals? And yeah, signals I think so. Too. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, you should be lightening up and, and, and uh, changing your portfolio over time depending on market conditions, I think. That, that's, uh, you, you've done very well with, uh, with your listeners and your subscribers on that score, so kudos to you on that. But I think there's a lot of, I mean, Newmont Mining is a, is a household name uh, that is, uh, I, I think I just talked to someone who knows Newmont very well, uh, an exploration geologist who used to work for Newmont, and he was talking to some of their leading people down in Australia. Australia earlier this week, and he said he believes that Newmont has really turned things around. Barrick, on the other hand, he's not so sure of. They have a thirty billion dollars worth of debt, and he says if we see a thousand dollar gold, you know, his his view wasn't was that he's not sure Barrick will will survive. So that's you know one of the biggest guys mm. out there. Uh, on the other right. hand, there's a little company called Dynacore Gold Mines. Uh, it's small. It trades in Canada, trades in the U.S. as well, uh, and they have a very unique uh, a very unique model. They Actually, just they process ore from in Peru. In Peru, there's there's literally thousands of gold mines, uh, mom and pop gold mines, and they're too small to build their own milling facilities. So this company has uh, done very very well, making money. Makes I think it's make twenty thirty cents a share this year, and it keeps growing it organically. It doesn't issue shares. It keeps plowing its profits back in, and it has the potential to uncover a very major deposit as well. So I like the idea that it can take its own cash flows and explore, and it doesn't have to raise capital and issue more shares to do that. And then there's another company that I would mention to you. It's my favorite exploration stock. It's called Novo Resources. It doesn't trade. It trades in Canada, also trades in the United States, NOVO Resources. And what I really like about this, two things. First, it looks like it should be able to get into production this uh, within the next year at a very, very high margins. Uh, its, its profit margins should be very high for reasons we don't have time to go into, but what I, I write about this frequently in my newsletter and talk about it on my radio show. Uh, Quentin Henning is the CEO used to work for Newmont, and there's a deposit called the Whitwaters Rand deposit where approximately a third or 40% of all the gold ever mined in the history of man come from uh, in South Africa, the Whitwaters Rand deposit. Now, Quentin Henning studied Whitwaters Rand rock, and he believes he has the potential at this project to outline uh, another Whitwaters Rand. He, he's convinced geologically he has a Whitwaters Rand project. Uh, the question now is how big is it, and uh, things are looking very, very positive there. So what I like about that one is potential cash flow early on by the within the next year, uh, and then the potential to use those cash flows uh, to try to find the uh, the the elephant uh, uh, deposit there, potentially the next Whitwaters Rand deposit. So those are a few ideas, but I, I write I have something like forty or fifty names on my list. So I, those are just a few that I throw out to you for now. Yeah, appreciate that. And a lot of these companies, like in all commodities, especially the miners, they have to uh, be producing and, and operating above mining costs. Sure. And uh, with prices going down, I guess many of these companies are faced with just operating at a loss right now. Is that true? A lot not? of them are. And, uh, you know, a lot of them are sort of like uh, on an accounting basis, maybe they're losing money, but on an operating cash flow, they're making money, uh, but they're not making enough to replace their assets potentially uh, uh, or to find more deposits, which is really the big guys are having a hard time replacing the, the gold they produce every year, the million or two million ounces a year to find that. It's becoming increasingly difficult because the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, has been has been mined out a long time ago. You know, the, the, the gold that was on the outcrops uh, that in biblical times they mined back then, you know, now they have to go 
go a mile, two miles under the under the uh, face of the Earth a lot of times to find to find the gold, or into the Arctic Circle and places like that. Yeah, it's 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 a difficult business, but no, there's still a lot of them that are that are making money, and we we're sticking those, we're emphasizing those right now uh, because they don't have to go out and issue shares to stay afloat, and that, that's the big uh, the big risk with the exploration companies is they have to raise capital by issuing shares. It's not so bad when the market is strong, but now when nobody is buying the mining shares, um, you know these guys have to dilute their shareholder interest to such a great extent that it is uh, it is problematic. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough time. It's in one way, it's a very difficult time. On the other hand, I think it's a time, an opportune time, to really pick up some bargains. So that's what we try to do in our newsletter, uh, on an ongoing basis. The mining sector, the mining industry itself, I would assume, is similar to the oil industry in the fact that you have your those who go out and explore and produce your E and P, so your you know your actual miners themselves, and you got have the guys who sell the picks and the axes. Of course, the oil services, or I guess the mining services. Mm-hmm. Is that industry kind of mirror the oil industry in that way? It kind of has the same kind of subsectors. Yeah, I think that, I think that's right. But I think the oil industry is probably not as difficult in some ways. Um, you know, I, I think the complexities of building a mine, and especially these days with all the environmental restrictions and and, and uh, political issues. Uh, well, you have some of that. You certainly have that in the oil fat in the oil patch as well. Yeah, I think it, I think the analogy is good. And and certainly, you know, Caterpillar would be the the picks and the axe in the mining industry. Caterpillar. Uh, or some of those big heavy equipment uh, companies that produce the stuff you have, the the equipment you need to dig the, uh, to pull the uh, ore out of the ground. Um, yeah, you could. I think those are companies that do well. I think this little Dynacore that I just mentioned, in a way, does that because what they do is they they just simply mill the ore for the for the small mom and pop operators, and they build in a profit margin. So if the gold price goes down, they maintain their profit margin pretty well. So that's one of the reasons I like that one. But yeah, I think there's a, good, a lot of parallels between the oil industry. And, and, the, and the mining industry for sure. Several months ago, we had Nolan Watson, who's the CEO at Sam, uh, Sandstorm yes, Gold. Yes, I know him. Pro- mm-hmm. On the program, yep. yeah, and and of course he was explaining how the streaming business worked. He helped that set that up over at Silver Wheaton. Are you a fan of the streaming business model? Absolutely, it uh, that's a stock that I follow, and it's one on my list. And I know Nolan; I've had him on my radio show as well. And uh, yeah, that's that. I think is a very good uh, a very good model, uh, and probably the best model in terms of you know if people don't. If people don't want to spend a lot of time understanding the companies, they want to own it. It's almost like owning a, a mutual fund in a way. Uh, only um, you know they don't have to worry about sustaining capital, uh, whereas most mining companies have to keep replacing and spending money to grow their their mine. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think and and you have diversification there too with a lot of different projects in different countries. So yeah, I I, I like that sandstorm, and that is uh, certainly one that's at the top of my list as well. Fantastic, Jay. Well, this has really been an informative interview. Uh, for our folks who are listening, they are new to your work. How can they find out more about you? Best place to go is Jay Taylor Media, J A Y Taylor Media dot com, and uh, yeah, they can listen to my radio shows as podcast there as well. Fantastic. Well, it sure is good to have you on the program. I sure do appreciate your time. Thank you, Jerry. It's a pleasure talking with you. All right, friends. Well, that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much for tuning in each and every week right here to Follow the Money Weekly Radio. You know, you can always find us online at our website, ftmdaily.com. We also have a news section of our website that you can always get the latest happenings, whether it's having to do with the petrodollar system or whether it's having to do with the 2016 presidential election. You just simply go to ftmdaily.com forward slash news, and there you'll find a feed from our Facebook page, And that way you can stay up to date with what's happening and also get my take on those things as they occur. Well, as always, I leave you with this uh, final word written by P.W. Litchfield when he said, One realizes the full importance of time only when there is little of it left. Every man's greatest capital asset is his unexpired years of productive life. Friends, this life is like a vapor, a wisp of smoke. And before we know it, it's all gone. So live each day to the fullest. And don't rob yourself by wasting time. Instead, focus on being productive instead of being busy. And that's just something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and we'll see you right back here next week. Till then, God bless. 
of the information contained on the Follow the Money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes. It should not be construed as specific investment advice. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. Jerry Robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Follow-up, individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations. Past performance is not indicative of future results. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussion on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence.